praise the Lord and uh, I'm glad to have this opportunity once again to bring to you this uh, uh, presentation. And uh, this is number seven in the series, The Prophets. And uh, I'm going to look at uh, should um, PG white materials be used as a test of fellowship. This is part one of three uh, in this presentation. And uh, continue praying for me, continue praying for the church of God. And uh, uh, I want to say that uh, we are living in a very solemn times where we need the presence of the Lord to guide us. And so let just uh, everyone be praying that we shall be anchored in Jesus Christ and nothing shall uh, dissuade us from following this narrow path. I want us to have a word of prayer, and then uh, we shall be able to continue. Abba Father, thank you for the day that is coming to an end, and thank you for the strength that you give unto us. I pray for myself, I pray for your people, and I pray for your church, that uh, you may have men and women who shall stand for the truth, and nothing shall uh, veer them off the narrow track and narrow path that you have set before us. With Jesus as a cap our captain, we pray that uh, we may always look unto him, that our eyes may be fixed unto the glory that is set before us. As you have put eternity in our hearts, so Lord, let not the enemy of soul snatch it from us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And so, this is one of the things that uh, you get the people ask now and then. And uh, it is good that uh, through the people who lived in her time and uh, what we have come to study to find out that uh, are her writings to be used as a test of fellowship. And so we have a ground to cover. And my prayer is always that uh, we may not just hurry through information, but we may understand uh, what um, we are reading. And so I'll be reading and reading. If any time you feel like you need the material, just conduct me. I'll be able to give you what I'm sharing. Because sometimes we share and then it seems that uh, we are fast and others are um, not uh, moving along with us. Otherwise, um, the, the issue is, uh, should the writings of Sister White be used as, as a test of fellowship? There should be no trial or labor with those who have never seen the individual having visions. I'm quoting from uh, Gospel Workers 1892 edition page 279.3. There should be no trial or labor with those who have never seen the individual having visions and who have no personal knowledge of the influence of the visions. Such should not be deprived of the benefits and privileges of the church. If their Christian cause is otherwise correct, and they have formed a good Christian character. That is a very explicit quote that we don't need to err in it. Yet, when men long into truth starts to quibble with what has been proved to be truth, a word of warning should not be withheld from them. So the newbies into the truth, they don't need to be tested with the uh E.G. White writings, and if they have formed a good character, a character fit, uh, then the, they should not be troubled with anything uh, concerning her visions. And there is a qualifying statement, yet when men long into truth starts to quibble with what has been proved to be truth, a word of warning should not be withheld from them. Some of our brethren have heard long experience in the truth and have for years been acquainted with me 
and with the influence of the vision, they have tested the truthfulness of these testimonies and asserted their beliefs in them. They have felt the powerful influence of the Spirit of God resting upon them to witness the truthfulness of the visions. If such, when reproved through vision, rise up against them and work secretly to injure our influence, they should be faithfully dealt with for their influence is endangering those who lack experience. And so if uh, there have been a people who have been in truth and um, they have been acquainted with this work, then uh, if they rise against uh, the testimonies, if they rise against the testimonies and uh, give an influence which is injurious to others, then uh, they, they should be warned of, uh, uh, they should be warned um, they, they should be faithfully dealt with for their influence is endangering those who lack experience. They should not be left on their own to go against the testimonies, to go against the visions and cast uh, a cloud on them. Now, talking about um, those who have been acquainted with the vision and um, they just go against them um uh, and uh, they cast a bad influence on them also there's something that uh, needs to be done and uh, i like just uh, try to put something on the screen on how uh, these wrongdoers. In uh, Selected Messages Book 2, page uh, 152, paragraph 4, 152, paragraph 4, we read, this is 2SM 152.4. When men endanger the work and cause of God by their own wrong course of action, shall they hear no voice of reproof? If the wrongdoer only were concerned and the work reached no further than him, he alone should have the words of warning. But when his course of action is doing positive harm to the cause of truth and souls are imperiled, God requires that the warning be as broad as the injury done. And uh, so this is it. Some of the brethren have had a long experience in the truth and have for years been acquainted with me and with the influence of the visions. They have tested the faith truthfulness of these testimonies and asserted their belief in them. They have felt the powerful influence of the spirit of God resting upon them to witness the truthfulness of the visions. If such, when reproved through vision, rise up against them and work secretly to injure our influence, they should be faithfully dealt with, for their influence is endangering those who lack experience. Testimonies to the Church, Volume 1, page 382, also quoted in Gospel Workers, 1892 edition, page 280, paragraph 1. Again, we are told, in public labor, do not make prominent and quote that which Sister White has written as authority to sustain your positions. To do this will not increase faith in the testimonies. Bring your evidences clear and plain from the word of God. As thus saith the Lord is the strongest testimony you can possibly present to the people. Let none be educated to look to Sister White, but to the mighty God who gives instruction to Sister White. And so there's danger in um, having an idol uh, in the name of a messenger or a prophetess or a prophet among us. Many times you'll find that um, what people exalt so much is the carrier of the messenger, of the message, not the giver of the message. And so many times people have made an idol of Sister White. Many times they have made an idol of their favorite speakers. And many times people have made an idol of uh, this and that uh, preacher, which is not uh, good. And so God has been forgotten and people have focused on men rather than focusing on God. And we are looking at uh, should 
e.g. white materials be used as a test of faith. This is uh, uh, number seven in the series, The Prophets, presentation one of three in the same uh, presentation. Question. Do you require a person to believe the testimonies before baptizing him and receiving him in the into, into church fellowship? This is from um, church. It is organization or and discipline by John Laubra or John Lauboro, page 162, paragraph 3. Answer. Instruction should be given with reference to the gift of prophecy and its manifestation among Seventh-day Adventists. And the candidate should have opportunity to read enough of Sister White's writings to learn the practical bearing and nature of her work among these people. There have been cases in the past where persons were baptized before they had even heard that there was such a gift among the denomination. Such a course is decidedly wrong. In some instances, they they. In, in some instances, sorry, there was afterward war in the camp as those individuals claim they had been deceived by being brought into fellowship before they knew that the spirit of prophecy was among these people. Just how we should deal with different cases in reference to belief or unbelief in the testimonies is plainly stated by Sister White herself in Gospel Workers, page 279 and 280. And this is what we have just read above that um, the newbies should not be tested by her writings, but those who have been acquainted with her writings and her visions, when they go to um, uh, um, uh, injure the course of the church and go against her material, then a warning should be given unto them. It means they have had a sufficient time to read her material. Now, why should why should somebody be given a time to go through Sister White material before uh, even they are baptized or allowed into the fellowship? Uh, for the reason that it has been given, some have said that uh, they were trapped into something they didn't know. And so we want to avoid such uh, traps. Now, somebody may ask, so if today somebody believes Jesus Christ is the son of God like the eunuch, um, Ethiopian eunuch, does that person need to wait and read and read of E.G. White materials? No. In in uh, Gospel Workers 1892 edition, page 279, we were told that um, if the person has exhibited a character of a Christian, there is no problem in uh, having fellowship with that uh, person. And so that is clear, and I, I won't uh, uh, spend much time on that. On page 247 of the same book is presented how withholding the testimonies from the people leave them without that which will carry them forward to an experimental religion of vital goldness. And so we, we shouldn't act as Jesuits where actually we trap people into something and then when we are asked of it, we become, uh, uh, we become angry and we behave uh, in an Christian way, and we start censoring and disfellowshipping people on the grounds which actually they didn't know anything about. Such a traps are not the best traps, and so uh, even in the preliminary uh, uh, presentation, we should be able to tell somebody, okay, the church has the gift of prophecy, and explain whatever we can explain. And so, the reference cited again in Gospel Workers, uh, 1892, page 280, paragraph 1, just to read, there was some in a certain church who were God's children and yet doubted the visions. Others had no opposition, yet they had not taken a decided stand in regard to them. There should be no trial or labor with those who have never seen the individual having visions, and who have no personal knowledge of the influence of the visions. Should such not be such should not be deprived of the benefits and privileges of the church if their Christian course is otherwise correct and they have formed a good Christian character. But those who have been acquainted with the visions, if they rise, then a warning should be given unto them. This is James White in Adventist Review and Sabbath Herald, page 69, paragraph 19. He says, 
there is a class of persons who are determined to have it that the review and its conductors make the views of, of Miss White a taste of doctrine and Christian fellowship. It may be duty to notice these persons on account of the part they are acting, which is calculated to deceive some. And so people are saying that in Review and Herald, there is a tendency of putting in the forefront the materials of E.G. White and uh, making them a test of fellowship to the people who are to be Seventh-day Adventists. And James White responding that this is calculated to deceive the people. That is not what is happening in Review and Herald. That is not the stand of Seventh-day Adventists in their days. Maybe it may be in these days, that, but, but it was not um, uh, the, 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 the decision of the church in, that, in those days. In uh, 61, paragraph 20, he continues to say, What has the review to do with Miss White's views? The sentiments published in its columns are all drawn from the Holy Scriptures. No writer of the review has ever referred to them as authority on any point. The review for five years has not published one of them. It is motto has been the Bible and the Bible alone, the only rule of faith and duty. Then why should this man charge the review with being a supporter of Miss White views? That is in October 16, 1855, James White Adventist Review and Sabbath Herald page uh, 61 paragraph 20. Again, he says, how has the editor of the review regarded visions and the gifts of the gospel church for more than eight years past? His uniform statements in print on this subject will satisfactorily answer the question. The following is from a tract he published in 1847 and we read, the Bible is a perfect and complete revelation. It is our only rule of faith and practice. But this is no reason why God may not show the past, present, and future fulfillment of, this, of his word in this last day by dreams and visions according to Peter's testimony, Peter quoting Joel chapter 2. True visions are given to lead us to God and to his written word, but those that are given for a new rule of faith and practice separate from the Bible cannot be from God and should be rejected. And so what James White is saying that if there be a prophet, if there be visions among us, then they should agree with the Bible and it should just be a light to continue leading the church of God and it shouldn't be something that is different from the Bible. And so that was the, the, the custom of the review to put the Bible in the forefront and the readers were not introduced to the visions, but they were introduced to the Bible and the Bible alone. We are looking at should um, the writings of Sister White be uh, used as a test of fellowship. This is number seven in the series, The Prophets, and one of the three presentations on this topic. Again, four years since he wrote on the gift of the gospel church, republished in review, for October 3rd, 1854, from which is taken the following, James White continues to say, every Christian is therefore in duty bound to take the Bible as a perfect rule of faith and duty. He should pray fervently to be aided by the Holy Spirit in searching the scriptures for the whole truth and for his whole duty. He is not at liberty to turn from them to learn his duty through any of the gifts. We say that the very moment he does, he places the gift in wrong place and takes an extremely dangerous position. And uh, this is what I was saying. Putting the, putting the, uh, the cart before the horse. In that people have esteemed the gift more than the giver of the gift. Now think about this for a moment. Why are our brethren in the Sunday churches so deceived? Because they have taken their ministers and put them on the forefront in that they wouldn't listen to what the Bible says. And this plague is also coming in Seventh-day Adventist. And we have seen this over and over again. You go to the church and you tell, Elder, you know what you are doing? This thing that you are doing is not well. And he will tell you, you know, I really understand what you are saying, but the pastor said this. 
So you sit down with the elders or which, which, whatever person in the church and you ask them, brother or sister, tell me between the pastor and the Bible, whom should we be taking our instruction from? And there has been this normal quote, quote that um, touch not the anointed of God. But how can they be anointed of God if they are speaking something that is different from the Bible? And so our brethren in the Sunday churches, they have given preeminence to their pastors and to their leaders. And that is why they will not sit down to study the Bible with anyone unless they invite their pastors or they tell you that the pastor says so and so. Why has many of them been deceived? It is through the gift of healing and the gift of turn. In quotes. Because what you will call the gift of healing in those churches, actually, it is nothing more than sorcery. And if it is not sorcery, in those churches, we have a testimony that God is in the business of saving his people. And he will use even a wicked person to, 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 to pray and a person get healed. And is the prayer of that person that healed the other person who was sick? No. We are told it is because of the faith of this person that they are healed and not of this wicked preacher that uh, is um, really uh, praying. Also, this gift of heal of, of uh, tongues has been put on the forefront in that the people trust that these people are talking with the Father or the Son or with the angels or they are inspired by the Holy Spirit to speak in different tongues when actually what they are speaking cannot be understood by either heaven or earth, but it is on their own things. And so James White says, the moment you put the gift before the Bible, you have put the gift in the wrong place. The Bible should be the rule of faith, the rule of conduct, character, and the litmus test if somebody is a Christian and not Sister White writing. But again, I'll say this, that... Uh, you will find that whoever is conforming to the Bible will conform to the spirit of prophecy or to the gifts given to the churches, the true gifts given to the church. And so James White also in uh, Adventist Review and Sabbath Herald, page 61, paragraph 25, he continues saying, now if this paragraph were not in print, his, his enemies might accuse him of changing his position, but as one who printed, as one was printed year, eight years since and the other four and reprinted one year since there are nails driven in the right places slanderous reports must fall powerless before facts of this character and so, so whosoever was accusing seventh day adventist and uh, uh james white that um they had put in the forefront the writings of sister white james white says that let them refer to the previous materials and see what has been the stand of the review and herald again in the review extra published march 1855 is the following statement from the church that had been personally acquainted um is this following statement from the church that had been personally acquainted with the facts in the case for three years and he says and uh, this this was um uh, authored by jt otton in behalf of the church this certifies that we have been acquainted with brother and sister white and their teachings and labors in church trials and have never known them to urge the visions on anyone as a portion of religious faith or make them a test of fellowship so if this was not in print and in record the slanderers will say that um, james white and the churches were pushing the visions as a test of fellowship to the people who are coming to the church anew and wanted to be baptized. Continued on, St. St. Belden, Deacons, and T.B. Mead, the publishing committee have also spoken about upon this subject, yet these persons will have it that the visions are made at test. This same story was repeated over and over by the harbinger to raise prejudice, prejudice against the Sabbath. These men, have now taken it 
are, if possible, in a MENA style. They have rely, relieved Elder Marsh in this department and some of them far outstrip him in zeal and malice. Uh, continued on, we are told, but what deserves a special attention here is the unrighteous use some are making of the vision. And so look at what ST Belden and TB Mead are saying. There has been unrighteous use of the visions. They take the advantage of the common prejudice against visions, misrepresent them, and those who are not ready to join them in anathematizing them as the work of Saturn, then brand any view held by the body of Sabbath keepers as the vision view and not the Bible view of the subject. In this way, an unhallowed prejudice can be excited in the minds of some against any view. And even all the views held by the body of Christian called Adventist, Advent Sabbath keepers. This course has been and is being pursued on the subjects of the two horned beast sanctuary, time to commend the Sabbath and period of establishment of the kingdom of God on the earth. It should be here understood that all these views as held by the body of Sabbath, keeper, Sabbath keepers were brought out from the scriptures before Miss White had, had any view in regard to them. These sentiments are founded upon the scriptures as their only basis. E.R. Pini held as early as 1844 that the kingdom of God will not be established on the earth till the close of seventh millennium. The editor of the review has taught the same since 1845, five years before Miss White had a view of this subject, that the saints will go to heaven at Christ's second advent. And then the scriptures are given. Um, and then uh, uh, that the uh, a thousand years reign of the saints in judgment would be in the Father's house above New Jerusalem, which Jesus has gone to prepare for his followers while the earth remain desolate. Um, and uh, that at the end of the thousand years, Jesus will return to the earth with his saints to execute judgment upon all from Cain to the latest ungodly sinner, which cannot be until the second resurrection when all ungodly sinners will be raised. And so before E.G. White could give any, could get any vision about these views, we had people who were preaching them. Even when you look at the health message, Joseph Bates was doing all these things and um, uh, 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 um, living a healthful life uh, or a healthful lifestyle before even E.G. White had any vision of the health message. About the Sabbath, also, you found that Joseph Bates was keeping the Sabbath before then, and even at time he argued it, and Sister White warned him that he was so ardent about it before she had a vision. And so it should not be said that uh, Adventist doctrines were formulated by E.G. White. The people were having this doctrine, and the vision was just to strengthen that which was being held from the scriptures. Now, Miss White's view of this subject was not till 1850, yet the view of this subject held by the body of Sabbath keepers before and since 1850 is now branded as the vision view. And those who hold it are represented as forsaking the Bible and taking another rule of faith. A brother writing from the West to a brother in New York on this subject says, God will as certainly reject James White if he rejects his word as he has rejected Himes and Marsh. Now, it has come to this that in order to be sure to vo avoid the charges of infidelity and heresy from this man, it is necessary to renounce every point of religious faith with which Miss White's views are in harmony. Every friend of truth and right should protest against so unrighteous a cause. Brethren, be on your guard against this crafty mode of action to divide the church of God. Let the vision stand upon their own merits. It is our duty to teach and to hold up the hands of those who teach the word of God, also to mark those who cause divisions. And so this is not uh, something uh, new when he says that uh, let us mark those who cause uh, division. When you go to the Bible, uh, 
uh, we, we read thus, that we should be wary of those uh, uh, who cause division. And uh, this is, um, uh, I'll give you a verse, mark those who cause division. This is um, in uh, the book of Romans, chapter 16, verse 17 to 18. And uh, I'd like to go there. The book of uh, Mark, the book of uh, Romans, I mean, 16, 17 to 18. Romans 16, 17. We read now, I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offense contrary to the doctrine which have, you have learned and avoid them. And so after a doctrine has been established in the Bible as a Bible truth, it is not for us to cause a division when the testimonies agree with it and then say, whatever thing that uh, E.G. White says is true, then it has to be repudiated because it is a vision view and not the Bible view. This is the extreme uh, extremity of looking at um, the matters. Um, so let the vision stand upon their own merits. Again, we read, but these men are not willing to leave the visions on their own merits and let people alone who believe them, who take the Bible as their only rule of faith and duty. No, some among them pursue them with deception and slander. The... Publishing and preaching of such is an issue of bitterness against the visions and those who will not join them in their work of death. They make the visions a test. Their principal theme, even before an ungodly rabble, is opposition to and ridicule of the visions and their highest ambition and glory is to disaffect persons and divide churches and families. Of this, they boast from place to place and in their sheet of scandal. All persons may now see who it is that make Miss White views a test. It is not those who believe in the visions, but those who don't believe in them. And that is amazing to think about that. That those who make E.G. White's writings a test are those who do not read them, not those who read them. Those who have believed in them, they have no problem with them. If you believe them if, or if you don't believe in them, because they can prove everything from the Bible without E.G. White. And it should be so. No Seventh-day Adventist should be holding a doctrine that has been only believed by E.G. White or the pioneers. Everyone of us should believe that which is in the Bible. And after getting the vantage ground on the Bible, then you can check what Sister White's writing. She says, never quote me until you have a vantage ground with the Bible. Until you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, never quote me. Meaning that she wants you cemented in Christ. So that even if you come in her works or on her works, and they seem to be contradicting or causing confusion, you may be angered in Christ that you may not say, here now I'm confused what to do. Once you are angered in Christ, even if you meet something in the testimonies you don't understand, you shall still continue looking unto Christ and not say, oh, this church is in heresy or it is like this. And uh, I don't understand how they can have a prophet who has such a things that are not understandable. No, she says, let have your foot in, have a relationship with Jesus Christ, have a bandage with your Bible, and then uh, you can come to her writing, read her and quote her. But before that, never quote her. She says, lay my writing aside and it should not be used to defend any doctrine. And so while, the, while we take the Bible and the Bible alone as our rule of faith and duty and are rightly devoted to teaching the word, these persons as they go out from us seem to become at once enraged against the visions and imbued with bitterness against their former brethren. R. Hicks is a good example and engage with a rash zeal to divide churches and separate the nearest and dearest friend. What is their taste in this work? The visions. So those who don't believe in them, they are the ones who are making a taste, not those who believe in them. 
James White continues to say, now we shall go right along believing and teaching the word of the Lord. This is our business. And if we choose to believe Miss White's views, which harmonize with the word, this is our business and nobody's else. But if we should leave the word and look for a rule of faith and duty by some new revelation, then it will be the business of the church to silence me as a religious teacher. And so this is in simple uh, way. If somebody came to the church and says that um, I have read the writings of E.G. White and I have come to conclude this is the truth and that truth is not in harmony with the Bible, it is the business of the church to sit down with that person and prove what is the truth and not accept his or her interpretation of what she has or he has as the truth which does not align with the Bible. And that religious teacher should be stopped if he has a doctrine that E.G. White says, this is the truth, yet it's not in the uh, Bible. We have exposed some of the false statements of this man and suppose this was sufficient. We care not a straw of the slanderous falsehood on our own part. But if those who are prepared to show up their falsehoods think the cause demands their exposure, let them forward their testimonies to the office and will thoroughly expose them. This may be best, uh, James White saying. And uh, here is a letter from uh, Brother uh, Kerva or Carver. Brother White, it is with heartfelt joy that I take my pen to bear witness to the goodness of our God. And I do this the more cheerfully because I took occasion not long since to write to you in a different strain concerning the church at Richmond and Dayton. In the good providence of God, it became my privilege to take Brother Snoop to Richmond on his way to visit the churches. And I shall ever have reason to thank God for what I saw and experienced while with that church. To me, individually, it was a feast of far things from the Lord, especially our last meeting when the whole church came together to partake of the emblems of crucified Savior and that other ordinance of humility, feet washing. For months past my mind, for, for months past my mind had been displaced by trials and temptation to such a degree that the burden of my prayers became, Lord, withdraw not thy Holy Spirit from me, leave me not to myself or I fall. But at that meeting, the Lord graciously condescended to pour into my soul such a rich blessing that the language of my heart is, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is in, within me, bless his holy name. Yes, I feel a consciousness that the Lord has revived his work in me, also a sweet assuring that he will never leave me nor forsake me, but that I shall have a home with his people in the everlasting kingdom of his dear son. I cannot sufficiently praise God for what he has done for me, a poor, weak, sinful man, and then to think of the joys, blessedness, and glory yet in reservation for me, if faithful is surely enough to melt the hardest heart and cause one to cry out, Lord, what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visited him? My heart was made to rejoice also when our oldest daughter manifested a determination to go with the remnant to Mount Zion. Owing to peculiar circumstances, this important step will unavoidably bring great trials upon her. And I commended her, I commend her to the prayers of the church that uh, the rich blessing of God may attend her and that she may with the people of God at last have a right to enter those pearly gates of the new Jerusalem and take and partake of the blessedness of the new earth. My heart also yearns as never before for our for our, our other children and oh what a solace it will be to my heart to have the assurance that we should make an unbroken family in the kingdom of God. I solicit your prayers especially for our eldest son, now in the army for the union, that the Lord may preserve him alive and so work upon his judgment and conscience as to bring him to the cross of Christ for the salvation of his soul. But I wish to tell you what I saw at the meeting and the effect it had upon my mind. 
A short time ago, I trembled for that church when I learned that they were making, as I thought, an undue test of the visions of Sister White in admitting members into church fellowship and that several souls had been injured thereby. This fault I have seen thoroughly corrected so that the church now stands upon ground that God can and does approve and bless. And I hope and trust it will have a good effect upon those who have been injured. So the church at um, Richmond, let us just back up this from uh, this uh, person. This is um, a letter written by um, this is a letter written by um, by Brother Keva writing to Brother White concerning the church at Richmond and Dayton. How he was blessed and richly fed uh, 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 in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the meeting that was there. And even the daughter was richly blessed and uh, uh, she was among those that the father was praying that she would take the stand and um, be part of uh, the people who will enter the pearly gates of the kingdom of God. Now, Brother Keva tells Brother White that um, what he saw there was something that really made him sad that they were making a due test of Sister White's vision to the people as a, 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 as a fellowship to the people who are coming into the church. But then you notice he says in that paragraph that has been thoroughly uh, 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 um, that has been thoroughly done what he says that has been thoroughly uh, corrected and it's having a good effect upon those who have been injured. Let us reread again the paragraph. But I wish to tell you what I saw at that meeting and the effect it had upon my mind. A short time ago, I trembled for that church when I learned that they were making as I thought and do taste of the visions of Sister White in admitting members into the church fellowship, and that several souls have been injured thereby. So several souls were injured by this undue taste of Sister White's vision as a fellowship to the church. This fault I have seen thoroughly corrected, so that the church now have good, so that the church now stands upon the ground that God can and does approve and bless. And I hope and I hope that. And I hope and trust it will have a good effect upon those who have been injured. And so this is a, a wonderful testimony. What I witnessed at our recent meeting has increased my confidence that God is again visiting his people by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And my honest prayer is that my heart may be in a state of preparation when the time shall come for the outpouring of the let of the latter rain. I have long believed that uh, the mighty power of God will be displayed in behalf of the remnant who should live when the Lord is about to come. And I believe that those who are keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus are that remnant. And if so, why should it be thought a thing incredible that the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Spirit are among us? I trust that God in his infinite mercy is preparing me for that refreshing that is to come from his presence. See Acts chapter 3 verse 19. Are the refreshing from the Lord, repent ye and be converted, so that the refreshing, when the refreshing comes from the presence of the Lord, your sins may be blotted out. How appropriate it is that just before the Lord comes, and while he is yet in the heavenly sanctuary making the great atonement by virtue of which our sins are to be blotted out, that there should be a refreshing from his presence, and what are better adapted uh, to produce this refreshing than the outpouring of uh, his Holy Spirit. Oh, brethren, there is a good time coming to the people of God. It is coming from his own hand. Now it behooves us to be up and doing. Let us lay aside so far as possible the cares of life. Let us not have our affection set on the world, but resist all the adverse influences that Satan knows so well how to bring against us. Let us seek wisdom and strength where alone it may be found and putting our trust in Jesus, go forward in the path of duty, that God may guide and direct his people in all their ways to his glory and his salvation is the prayer of your unworthy brother, 
H-E, Kerva, Iowa, City, Iowa. So you, you can see the testimony of this brother and how he was blessed and what was injuring the church, how it was thoroughly corrected that the people now are being fellowshiped in the church who believed in the Bible and they had a character that corresponded to the Bible. Now, as uh, I end the last segment, testing the prophetic gift, uh, we shall be looking at this. It is not the primary purpose of this volume to state the Bible arguments in favor of spiritual gifts, including the gift of prophecy as an abiding heavenly endowment from the Lord to his church. And uh, this is um, uh, the fruition of spiritual gift. And uh, this is uh, H. Lewis Christian in the fruitage uh, of the spiritual gift. He says, when Christ gave his people the promise of the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit, he said that another comforter will, I, will abide with you forever, John 14, 16. The idea that spiritual gifts were only to be seen in the church during the apostolic age is totally false. In the scripture, there is not the slightest proof for such a view. And the only apparent reason why some churches teach this is that they do not have the gifts. On the other hand, proofs are most abundant that the gifts of the Spirit and above all the prophetic gifts were to be in the church always, and especially in the church at the end of human history. Seventh-day Adventists have ever told that this prophetic gift and other spiritual gifts will be found in the remnant church, and also that in the future, during the time of the latter rain, still larger manifestation of these powers will be experienced than have yet appeared. Because of certain opposition and misunderstanding in regard to the revelation given to the Lord's messenger in our day, it was found necessary in the early editions of the Spirit of Prophecy books to write a preface of explanation concerning the visions or an introduction on the Bible doctrine of the gifts. The first edition of Spiritual Gifts printed in 1858 contains an introduction by R.F. Cotre. It is quite an elaborate argument from the scriptures in favor of the abiding nature and helpful footage of the prophetic gift. Elder James White wrote a number of such articles. One of the most convincing called the spirit of prophecy was inserted as a preface in volume one of a set um, of uh, uh, larger books of the same title printed in 1870. Other men also prepared such an introduction, but we who wrote them for books here or overseas came in time to understand that they were not so needful as was, first, as was at first thought. Miss White's books were themselves the best proof of their divine origin. In fact, sometimes the reader found it easier to understand the book itself than the explanation of the book. In those years, too, there were many longer and shorter articles in the review in defense of the spiritual gifts, especially as seen in the messages sent by the servant of the Lord. In course of time, two a goodly number of books or pamphlets were written by our leaders, showing beyond a question that the visions and messages of Miss E.G. White met every test of uh, the prophetic gift. Such a pamphlet were written by Ryan Smith, J.H. Wagoner, Jane Andrews, as well as later ones by G.A. Iwin and others. A much larger and ed very excellent work entitled Rise and Progress of Seventh-day Adventist was written by Jane Lowbora one of the early veterans who had the great advantages of having seen and lived through what he was writing. Some of these things may seem a bit out of today, date today, and as some have said, not quite historical, but after all, when men tell what they have seen themselves, it carries weight and is more likely to be true to fact than what some call history. It is still possible to secure these books and our ministers do well to get them from some older member who have finished with them. A letter, a letter and most valuable book on the subject called The Testimony of Jesus by our veteran editor of the review, F.M. Wilcox, is just now having a large sale. It gives information that all should have. We recommend this publication to our readers and first of all to our ministers. They teach clearly that Spiritual gifts such as healing, tongues, and prophecy were not designed or given to the apostolic church alone, but are to be seen among God's people in all ages too. 
The gift of prophecy is to be found in the remnant church, that is God's people just before the second advent. Three, spiritual gifts will be found only among commandment-keeping Christians. And number four, although the Adventists do not make the testimonies a new Bible or an addition to the Bible, nor primarily a test of fellowship, yet they believe and follow these testimonies as messages from God for this age. Number five, Miss White's writing meet every fair Bible taste of the prophetic gift and contain abundant evidence of their divine origin and character. In this chapter, however, some other important points and experiences with the spiritual gift through the years are being dealt with. Uh, Christian Lewis continues to say in Fruitage of Spiritual Gifts, page 59, we live in an age of negative thinking. A deplorable result of the popular skepticism is in many large religious circles. Many believers today are so shy of false prophets that they are afraid even to accept the truth. Yet it's a greater spiritual achievement to discover and receive a true message of the Lord than to prove and reject those who mislead. In saying this, we will not minimize the importance of rejecting every counterfeit religious leader or movement. The scripture distinctly teaches us that we are not to believe every spirit, but we are to try the spirits. 1 John 4 1. To do so is not difficult. For the test to be applied are plain and easily made by even the humblest believer, and that is to the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, there is no light in them. Isaiah 8 verses 20. When the Lord sends a servant with a message from heaven, that individual is always willing to submit to any fair, fair test. In fact, almost all the prophets mentioned in the Bible had the experience of being tested by the people. In the case of Samuel, one of the greatest of the seers, the prophetic call was revealed while he was yet a child, so that right from the beginning of his work, Israel accepted him as a prophet. Then, too, the circumstances connected with his mother, ex mother's experience before his birth gave the people confidence in him as a prophet. John the Baptist was not accepted and in a way not rejected by the leaders in Israel. They professed not to know what he was not to know whether he was sent from God saying we cannot tell Mark 11:33 however his preaching was so spirit filled that the honest in heart believed it and after his death all men counted John that he was a prophet Mark 11:32 during the Babylonian captivity Ezekiel one of the mightiest of prophets had many visions of God he did some strange things as object lesson for the people but many did not believe in fact, not till after his death, when his vision was fulfilled, were they sure that he was a prophet, Ezekiel 33, verse 33. In like manner, Miss White, in the beginning of her work as God's messenger, met those who were not sure of her call and work. With many in America, there was a strong prejudice against prophets because of false prophets among the Mormons and spiritualists. Then, too, many churches which had no evidence of the prophetic gift in their midst will not conceive that God will speak to other religious bodies in this way. They were inclined to say with Zedekiah of all, which way went the spirit of the Lord from there, from me to speak unto thee? 2 Chronicles 18.23 While the majority of Seventh-day Adventists believed Miss White to be a messenger from the Lord, the question with some at least was more or less undecided as long as she lived. However, when her work was... Um, fully accepted as one sent of God. Uh, pardon me. However, when her work was finished and they looked at her godly life and found her teachings, without a single exception, in perfect harmony with the scriptures, the test was completed and she was fully accepted as one sent of God. This is so general true that when a person today embraces the Seventh-day Adventist faith, he not only accepts the doctrine of spiritual gifts, but also comes to believe in the gift of prophecy as manifested in the teachings of Miss White. This faith, too, will grow with the years as he sees her words fulfilled. It is quite generally understood among Christians, among Christian people today, that Seventh day Adventists believe in the perpetuity of spiritual gifts. It is also understood that we regard the visions of Miss White as having been given by the Spirit of God. However, the reasons why we believe in these gifts and the use which we make of spiritual gifts, particularly the visions of Miss White, are sometimes misunderstood. 
Some still seem to think that Adventists accept the testimonies as a new Bible or as an addition to the Bible, though nothing could be further from the truth. We accept the Holy Scriptures in full as divinely inspired and containing all the truth of God that is needed to make us wise unto salvation. We could easily copy a whole chapter of quotation from our strongest and earliest leaders in support to this statement. Elder James White wrote, The gifts of the Spirit should all have their proper places. The Bible is an everlasting rock. It is our rule of faith and practice. In the in it, the man of God is thoroughly furnished unto all good works. If every member of the church of Christ was holy, harmless and separate from sinners, and searched the Holy Scriptures diligently and with much prayer for duty, with the aid of the Holy Spirit, we think they will be able to learn their, holy duty, their whole duty in all good works. Thus, the man of God may be perfect, but as the reverse exists, that people are not studying their Bibles, and ever has existed, God in much mercy has pitied the weakness of his people and has set the gift in a gospel church to correct our errors and to lead us to his living word. Paul says that they are for the perfecting of the saints till we all come in the unity of the faith. The extreme necessity of the church in its imperfect state is God's opportunity to manifest the gifts of uh, the spirit. Every Christian is therefore in duty bound to take the Bible as a perfect rule of faith and duty. He should pray fervently to be aided by the Holy Spirit in searching the scripture for the whole truth and for his whole duty. He is not at liberty to turn from them to learn his duty through any of the gifts. We say that the very moment he does, he places the gifts in the wrong place and takes an extremely dangerous position. The word should be in front and the eye of the church should be placed upon it as the rule to walk by and the fountain of wisdom from which to learn duty is all good works but if a portion of the church err from the truth of the bible and become weak and sickly and the flock become scattered so that it seems necessary for god to employ the gift of the spirit to correct revive and heal the erring we should let him work yeah more we should pray for him to work and plead honestly that he sh he will work by the spirit's power and bring the scattered sheep to his fold. Praise the Lord, he will work. Amen. And so that is a num uh, that is a presentation number one of three. Should the writings of E.G. White be used as a test of fellowship? And we have gone through much of what um, James White wrote. And when we, we shall be doing number two, we shall see various uh, uh, writings from various pioneers, how the a spirit of prophecy should be used in church when we are talking about church fellowship. What did Sister White say why her materials were given? I want just to point out this, why her writings were given, and then uh, I say something and uh, we close up. Um, uh, she says, In 50, 60, 63, paragraph 1, I want us to see this from her own pen. She says this, not to take the place of the Bible, that uh, the testimonies were not given to take the place of the Bible. The following extract from a testimony published in 1876 will show. Brother J will confuse the mind by seeking to make it appear that the light of God has given through the te testimonies is an addition to the word of God, but it, in this he presents the matter in a false light. God has seen fit in this manner to bring the minds of his people to his word to give them a clear understanding of it. The word of God is sufficient to enlighten most beclouded mind and may be understood by those who have any desire to understand it. But notwithstanding all this, some who profess to make the word of God their study are found living in direct opposition to its plainest teaching. Then to leave men and women without excuse, God gives plain and pointed testimonies to bringing them back to the word that they have neglected to follow. The word of God abounds in general principles for the formation of 
correct habits of living, and the testimonies, general and personal, have been calculated to call their attention more especially to these principles. So they are not to take the place of the Bible, but because people have become dull in their understanding, people do not really follow the Bible, they are saying they are following, God has given the gift of prophecy to uh, lead men back to the Bible. And so uh, another thing is uh, she says this, and uh, this is the last thing I'm reading. This is the last thing I'm reading from E.G. White herself about her material. She says, I took the precious Bible and surrounded it with the several testimonies for the church given for the people of God. Here, said I, the cases of nearly all are met. The sins they are to shun are pointed out. The counsel that they desire can be found here, given for other cases situated similarly to themselves. Now she says, God has pleased God has been pleased to give you line upon line and precept upon precept. That is Bible. But there are not many of you that really know what is contained in the testimonies. You are not familiar with the scriptures. If you had made God's word your study with the desire to reach the Bible standard they attain and attain to Christian perfection, you will not, you will not have needed the testimonies. It is because you have neglected to acquaint yourself with the God's inspired book that he has sought to reach you by simple direct testimonies, calling your attention to the words of inspiration which you had neglected to obey and urging you to fashion your lives in accordance with it is pure and elevated teachings. And so one of the reasons why we are having a problem with E.G. White is because the church has taken one gift and the people have taken one gift and put it in forefront in that other gifts have been overshadowed, which are many in the church. You can read the, about them in Ephesians chapter uh, 4. We have the, spirit, the, the gift of prophecy. We have teachers. We have apostles. We have administrators. These gifts have not been uh, really are uh, pointed out and they have not uh, been uh, made of uh, prominence but the gift of prophecy or uh, the writings of sister whites and uh, have been put on the forefront in that they have overshadowed the other uh, uh, gifts and so the world thinks that the only thing that Adventists have is what is called Miss White writings and that is the gift of prophecy and they come short of all other gifts. That is why you will hear in some circles people say, the Seventh-day Adventists do not have the spirit. And what do they mean by that? You will find that is being talked about by those who have the gift of tongues, the apparent gift of tongues, and those who have the apparent gift of healing. And uh, there are even others who are calling them apostles in other churches. And so they see Seventh-day Adventists and they ask, what kind of church would only have one person who is a woman having the gift of prophecy and all the other gifts are not there? The, the only way to solve this issue is not to reject E.G. White and her writing. The only way the church can confront this is to uh, uh, insist on the other gift, to be able to point to the other gifts of the Holy Spirit that are in our midst and the way they are working and then they shall be a church that is wholesome and not a one gifted church that uh, has only a one prophet. And, uh, you know, the reason also why people think that we only have one prophet is because people among us do not understand the gift of prophet in its wider sense. John the Baptist never did any miracle, but he was a greatest prophet that ever lived. And so when we talk about the gift of prophecy, the only thing or the gift, the office of the prophet, the only thing people think is about doing some charismatic, marvelous thing and mysterious thing, healing and doing some stuff that no one else can do. But you look at John the Baptist and you'll see that there was a prophet amongst the people in those days. And you look at other prophets, people like uh, Nathan in the Old Testament, and 
even in some uh, uh, circles, David is called a prophet, where, and he never did any uh, uh, um, miracles. And we have Samuel who was a seer and a prophet. You look at the wider gift of prophecy or the office of the prophet, and you'll find that even in Adventism, uh, uh, God has been able to manifest this um, office, uh, not just in one particular line, but uh, 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 in many ways. But we don't want to open a Pandora of uh, a box that we are shut in that um, we have only one person who has the gift of prophecy among us. In the end time, God says that he shall give visions, dreams uh, uh, to many people and miracles will be performed among us. And so it's the gift, it's the writings of Sister White attest to the church. I think I have explained uh, and I have read material that we are able to correspond with and see what we are saying. It should not be made a test to those who are coming new in the faith. The people should be given a fair chance to read through her materials. And we have been told that those people who are living according to the Christian standard and are coming to the church, they should be accepted in the fellowship. And people should be told that we have this gift manifested among us so that they may not say that they were trapped into a certain religion they didn't understand and that now they are stuck. And when they go out, they, they, they become angry and they leave the church. And um, when they go out, they start uh, now uh, um, talking negative and uh, spreading lies about uh, the gift itself. So let us be open. Let us give fair chance. Let us do what should be done. Let Seventh Day Adventists prove their doctrines from the Bible. Let them let them be the rule of their faith, because this is what we shall do during the Sunday law. We shall not stand with Sister White. Those who shall come in, they shall just understand we had the gift of prophecy, but they will have been brought in by the Bible and the Bible alone. Otherwise, may the Lord bless us, and may we continue learning together. Shall we uh, offer a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, in many ways we err and uh, go to the extent and extremes that shall not be gone. We pray that uh, in whichever places we have been the stumbling block by putting the cart before the horse, that Lord, we cannot atone for our past. That is something so clear into my mind. But Lord, we can use the chance that has been given to us to do the right thing. No one has ever fallen so much that cannot be redeemed. And so those whom we have injured, some have died, and we can confess to them and ask them for forgiveness. But Lord, you are so sufficient for us. You are a loving Father, and we come in contrite of heart. You may forgive us, and Lord, that we may have a chance in the kingdom once again. May you guide us with thy spirit to do the right thing at the right time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And so may the Lord bless us as we continue in this series. And uh, may we continue praying for each other and encouraging each other as even we see the day nearing. May the Lord bless us and uh, bye for now.